Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. This week you'll hear a chat with Simon Cedillo, author of Weapons, Drugs, and Money, Crime, Corruption, and Community-Based Liberation in the U.S.-Mexico Neoliberal Military Political Economy. Simone talks a little about his early days in media near the start of the indie media world, his documentary that became the news website El Enemigo Común, which translates to The Common Enemy, which covered grassroots, indigenous-led movements in southern so-called Mexico, and about his book with a focus on intervention and integration from capitalist and military powers in the U.S., multinational banking and big pharma, and the violence against and resilience of indigenous communities under the nation state. There's a link in our show notes to one source for the book, but you can also check out the website weaponsdrugsandmoney.org for more info on how to order a copy. And the chapters are being posted and translated into Castellano at elenamigocommune.net, where you can find two decades plus of really interesting content. Simone suggests people follow Avispa Media, A-V-I-S-P-A dot org, as a project following in the legacy of El Enemigo Común. My name is Simone Cedillo, he, him, they, I... I'm the author of Weapons, Drugs, and Money. I'm a professional partner with the Earlham College Border Studies Program out of Tucson, Arizona. I am a community rights defense organizer, and I also write investigative articles and research about geopolitics and political economy in Mexico and the United States. I teach geopolitics and political economy across the United States at universities and high schools. I have done so for the last 15 years. And I'm also a pochoy crew in Muay Thai. So I teach Muay Thai as well. Cool. Um, and I use he, him pronouns and I go by bursts. I forget to say that a lot during the interviews. And it's <laughs> it feels interrogative if I'm just like, what's your pronoun? So could you share a bit about how you got involved in political activism as well as journalism? Sure. I think for me, my identity is like I was born into earth, radicalized and politicized. My identity is complicated. You know, here while I'm in France, people ask me, well, what are you? I'm like, well, automatically I sound Mexican. That's like the easiest thing. But it's much more complex than that. I was born in the so-called state of New Mexico, and I am of indigenous descent. And those of us from where I'm from, we are starting to identify ourselves as Genisados. A lot of us are taking on that identity. Some people have had taken it on for a while. And Genisado basically means that we're descendants of native peoples who were enslaved in that region. Um, As Mexicans, we often use the word mestizo to talk about ourselves, but mestizo is just a pretty way of saying colonial rape. And my identity is very much so attached to the colonial rape that occurred in the state of Mexico, both on my mom's side and my dad's side. Um, So that's very much so part of me part of my physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual identity um, and has definitely informed and contributed to the rage that I carry on this earth and how I walk and the purpose that I have behind everything that I do. So at a core, that's it. I have an ancestral trauma and ancestral medicine that I carry with me as I move forward in all the work that I do. And uh, my book is very much so attached to that. And my work is very much so attached to that. As I move forward in life, you know, I'm just another criminalized youth of color that at one point very early on in my adolescence was very aware of the fact that I wasn't nearly as criminal as systems of oppression, as governments, as transnational corporations, as financial institutions. And this was something that 
very early on, I was super affected by and was fortunate enough to have two different things happen in early, early or later adolescence was a homeless man I used to kick it with handed me Noam Chomsky's manufacturing consent. And that definitely helped me like gain some language for what I was feeling naturally. And in 1994, when I was 18, about to become 19, the Zapatista National Liberation Uprising in Chiapas, Mexico, completely and radically changed my perspective and my focus and my future from that moment forward. So that's the roots of what I did. In the United States, in addition to going to protests and kicking it with youth organizers and communities of color, one of the activities that I'm most engaged with that contributed to me getting into documentary video was Cop Watch. So I've done a lot of Cop Watch and Cop Watch was always at the forefront of things that I did before anything else. Um, Later on, by the time I was like 23, 24, we have the experience of indie media. And I'm kind of a poster child of indie media in the sense that Indie media activists saw the work that I was doing, gave me access to computers and hard drives and cameras and resources to be able to go do a lot more than I probably would have ever been able to do on my own without their support. And in the end, uh, it was indie media activists across the United States that uplifted me to get into touring and giving talks and presentations. And I don't know how the hell it happened, but all of a sudden, From those tours, I started teaching political political economy and geopolitics based upon my lived experiences and documentary films, and I just never stopped after that. It's kind of cool to think about the um, the indie media connection right there. That that was your like bringing you into like documentary filmmaking and these other like media things. Also, like there's no way to disconnect that from the legacy, the improvisation, and like the revolutionary manner which the EZLN came out to the world and engaged in their own their own counter information infrastructure uh so that's kind of cool to to see that like coming back around yeah and a lot of people don't know but some of like the old old heads from indie media made sure to remind people that indie media was a proposal of the easy ln in 1996 it was the easy ln who proposed that we start doing things like indie media and in 1999 at the World Trade Organization uh, protests in Seattle was the birth of indie media in response to that call from the EZLN. So yeah, we're all connected to that. That's awesome. Cool. I didn't know that. Thanks for making that connection. It just, I just kind of intuited. I'm like, these are Uh Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was actually directly connected, directly a, a call from the Zapatistas to do so. Yeah. And we did. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, so you were involved in a writing project with comrades and documentation project with comrades um, that that comrades and I in Northern California were reading during the Oaxaca uprising in 2006. I wonder if you could speak a bit about El Enemigo Común and like what it was or what it is and um, just a bit about its shape. For sure. Uh, well, El Enemigo Común originally was my first feature length documentary film called El Enemigo Común, which you can find just by typing that in YouTube. Um, and I, we had, in 2004, we, I was filming and had like a lot of footage put together, but hadn't finished yet. But we hosted the first national indie media conference at, in Austin, Texas. Uh, when I say we, I mean Austin indie media. We hosted it. And I was really kind of just kind of, on the sidelines offering support, though I was doing a lot of work, I, I, I really wasn't trying to get involved. But then as the conference grew and we started to see all these people, folks were like, man, you should really kind of present some of the stuff that you're doing. I was already going to Oaxaca, I'd already been getting in trouble doing video work. And that's where I met all these indie media activists who were like, bro, you got to you got to get out there. You got to do stuff. And then my friends in Austin were like, yeah, man, like you, you got to get out there and, and finish this work and go. So that was really motivating for me to finish the film El Enemigo Común. And I went 
on my first tour in 2005, where I met for the first time somebody who you might know, Bradley Allen, who was, he was the main tech guy for Indie Bay and the Indie USA and, um, and participated in global indie media. And he was like, man, you need a website. So he made El Enemigo Común for the film tour. Little did we know that El Enemigo Común, which came out in 2005, would basically predict the 2006 uprising and point eyes towards Ulises Riz Ortiz, the governor of Oaxaca, who was kind of responsible for the rep repression in Oaxaca City that detonated the uprising there. And then it just, that, that turned into something much larger than the film. From that moment forward, we started using the website to upload independent reporting that we were doing from, from Mexico to that website. And then it just grew into, for a while, it was the largest comprehensive bilingual website reporting on stuff from Southern Mexico. More recently, there are a lot better folks doing the work. Uh, we kind of maybe three years ago, kind of stopped publishing and I focused more on writing the book and we just kind of let stop doing because we saw that there were Oaxacans doing that work at a, at a level that was far more advanced than we could ever do. So I want to shout out their Avispa Media, who is now doing continuing to do that work and they're out there doing it. So we're kind of pointing all eyes towards them. But we hope to do to like kind of wrap up the whole El Enemigo Común process is to start publishing chapter by chapter of the book on there uh, and then just wrap it up with that and archive the website so people have access to it. But we don't suspect that we'll continue to be publishing reporting on that website. But we did for many, many years and did a lot, a lot of really good and powerful work. It's cool to hear about that part, the part that that website played and, and that the film and everything played in that ecosystem. I didn't know about the Avispa connection, but I love seeing their, seeing their reporting. Uh, that's, it's incredible. Um, yeah. So now I guess talking about weapons, drugs, money about the book, um, could you talk a bit about what you were aiming to do with the book? Uh, what needs you were looking to supplement and who your intended audience was? For sure. And the book really, like at its heart, comes from that adolescent, angry, criminalized youth perspective of like, there's really much more important criminals to be looking at. And from my experience from Cop Watch and then starting to travel early on to Oaxaca and starting to do really what became Military Watch and later involved into Paramilitary Watch, this turned into a 23-year endeavor of just documenting atrocities and the connection of to those uh, the connection of the U of US intelligence and military influence to those atrocities in Mexico. And that became my work through investigative articles and research and publications and documentary films. Also like um, along the way, like doing cultural things, music, community-based organizing things, but with always that focus of connecting repression back to the United States empire. Um, so the book is that 20 is those 23 years of doing the work of being in the places of seeing things and connecting dots to one really demystify this whole concept of neoliberalism in a way that makes it more accessible to like non-academic, non-activist, non-intellectual communities that are in need of uh, accessible analysis to confront neoliberalism and militarism in that way. And then two, to kind of put out some very clear examples of community-based liberation movements for self-determination, self-defense, and autonomy. Um, so those were the purposes of the book. And you kind of mentioned who the audience is, then it's people that need to hear that information and uh, that are going to be able to take activity, like take that, run with it, work with it, build off of it. And Yeah. I mean, the book right now is primarily being sold at, at, um, at to U.S. universities and now uh, incredibly so to U.S. high schools. Libraries and departments are purchasing it and using it for their courses. But for me, more importantly, community organizers are buying it and using it and using it kind of as a roadmap for for 
critical analysis, de-intellectualization of some of these more complicated concepts, and then a, a roadmap towards liberation. And the like, then that side of it, like that's that's really cool that it's getting into high schools and colleges, like just to sort of counter counter the push against like critical race theory, quote unquote. That's you know that the react more reactionary elements of the U.S. political establishment have been pushing for in the last couple of years, pulling back the veil and calling imperialism imperialism instead of saying you know this is our destiny as white people or whatever. Yeah, absolutely, and it, it is. It's pretty incredible. I'm expecting probably some blowback at some point as we get we move forward. At some point, I'm expecting more blowback. Haven't really gotten any just yet, but I I, I expect it'll come at some point. It's good to be prepared. <laughs> mm-hmm. Let's see. So I wonder if you could remind listeners a bit about just the relationship between the U.S. and Mexico, and particular between the ruling classes of the two countries. Like obviously, there's an unequal like military relationship you know historically and colonization that's occurred from the u.s into mexico um but but there's also i guess what i'm getting at with this question is by pointing to the ruling classes there is a degree of complicity among some of the more powerful like elites within both countries specifically and yeah if you could talk about like how that has kind of like shaped where mexico's at right now for sure i think it's interesting because people will say that Mexico has always managed to retain its sovereignty in the face of U.S. imperialism. And they cite that there are no U.S. military bases in Mexico. And the book argues that after the Monroe Doctrine, U.S. military and intelligence intervention in Mexico has been constant and ruthless. I say that the dirty war era that specialists identify from existing from like 19 in the 1960s to the 1980s actually begins uh, pre-Cold War in Mexico in 1947 with the CIA's creation of the Federal Defense Secretariat, which was an anti-communist CIA type organization within the Mexican military intelligence apparatus and has continued to this very day, that that has never ended. The dirty war that the United States has waged against dissidents, social activists, community organizers, and from my perspective, more specifically, indigenous communities struggling for self-determination, self-defense and autonomy, um, that war has been ongoing. We have a tremendous amount of declassified information that exposes things that are beyond the irrefutable. Um, one of the things that I talk about in the book is the Tlatelolco massacre of, in 1968. Well, the Mexican president, the secretary of defense, the major generals and directors of the federal uh, defense secretariat were all working as paid CIA agents during the time of that massacre. So this level of U.S. intervention, covert U.S. intervention into Mexican sovereignty is is so overwhelming that at the end of the day, what we can say is that the Mexican military is a paramilitary of the U.S. military industrial complex in Mexico and carries out a certain level of atrocity that the U.S. can then say, well, Mexico has its sovereignty. They're doing their own thing. We're not involved. But at the end of the day, it is clearly a U.S. political, economic, and military agenda that sets kind of the goals for what is going on one way or another. Um, And this is all, of course, attached to the interests of transnational corporations, uh, extractive industries, financial institutions, and again, the military industrial complex. Yeah, it was incredible in there to see the receipts. <laughs> I was like, oh, really? I had to look it up in a couple of places elsewhere, like didn't do like a bunch of deep dives or whatever, but it was clearly documented in articles that there is, yeah, declassified information connecting them to the CIA. And yeah, it, one like, of the things I always tell people back in the day when I started doing the work to collect these things, if you ever do this work, make sure you download the PDFs. Because a lot of that stuff is gone. A lot of those documents are not where I found them back in the day. 
And I just started downloading the PDFs. What Twent started doing that many, many years ago. And now it's all there compiled in that book. You know, obviously you said Monroe Doctrine, and we could unpack that a little bit if we wanted to. Um, but also the like anti, like under the rubric, like U.S. intervening in other countries under the rubric of anti-communism, um, like anti-communism during that period of time was synonymous with denying national liberation struggles, right? And national and sovereignty struggles or indigenous sovereignty struggles. Absolutely. What I always say is like it has it at the end of the day, it had nothing to do with anti-communism. It had to do with pro-U.S. political and economic and military interests more than anything. And and anybody that even remotely challenged those interests, anybody that remotely organized and opposed them. And at the end of the day, what those interests are, are the military political economy of white male supremacy. Anybody that specifically challenges, opposes, and worse, provides an effective alternative to contributing to the military political economy of white male supremacy is considered a military target. And that's what we saw going on more than communism. And that's what we, what I spy say it's ongoing because back then the excuse was communism. That is, excuse later evolved into terrorism and now has evolved into the narco. But what we're seeing is that those are all uh, excuses to specifically target communities who are struggling for grassroots community-based liberation. Yeah, well put. So the first time that I heard the term neoliberalism, it was in reference to a critique by the Zapatista movement. But it's a word that I feel, and I, I think I think you do too, feels get it gets bandied about without a good definition sometimes. So I wonder if you could give us your working definition of the term and some of the institutions associated with the framework. Like how and well, yeah, I'll I'll wait and maybe ask the, the second part of that. For sure. Um, one of the things I'm proudest about what the book has done up to date right now since its release is that I get constant feedback from university professors that say, finally, I have a book that I can give to my students. And it's not a bunch of information that I have to synthesize to them. This is something that they can read that is accessible to them to understand these concepts that are extremely complicated. Neoliberalism is just a, the most current incarnation of capitalist imperialism, which are also two words that people like to throw around without really kind of digesting. All we're saying is the taking of land, labor, and resources uh, by force for profit. What I did in particular with my definition of neoliberalism with, of course, the help of the Zapatista analysis was to add the militarism component. People tend to focus on the political and economic, that is the money and power behind how neoliberalism works. But if you don't talk about the military strategies employed to enforce those strategies for political and economic power, then you have an incomplete definition. So my working definition that is entering and being circulated around academic institutions in the United States over the last couple of years, since even before the book was published, is that neoliberalism is a military political economy that prioritizes the interests of transnational corporations and financial institutions over the basic rights of communities. Now, that has also now evolved into not just a military political economy, but then with what we witnessed in Chiapas, Oaxaca, and Guerrero, a paramilitary political economy, and now more recently and more clearly, a narco-paramilitary political economy that has these specific uh, interests in mind, more than anything, extractive resources and for-profit uh, weapons proliferation. So <clears throat> that's kind of in a nutshell my my definition. I don't I don't feel like it's it needs to get more complicated than that. A lot of the literature that is out there, a lot of the academics that talk about this stuff, I feel like they over intellectualize and make it significantly more inaccessible <laughs> for people to even try to digest and really go through some of this stuff. But it's not that complicated. 
What is complicated, I think, at the end of the day, and what the book helps with is identifying characters, you know, uh, agents of neoliberalism, if you will. And I, so I, I broaden our, our, our understanding of industrial complex and not just talk about the prison industrial complex, not just talk about the, web, the military industrial complex, but talk about all of these different industries that participate as industrial complexes in complicity with legislative bodies, in complicity with financial institutions, in complicity with criminal activity that is profitable to the U.S. More recently, I think one of the things that differentiates neoliberalism from other incarnations of capitalist imperialism is that neoliberalism has always fronted like it's seeking out democracy, like it's seeking out social responsibility. And well, that's kind of like the whole lie. It's like you can't take people's land, labor, and resources by force for profit in a socially responsible or a democratic way. And that, in a nutshell, is the difference between neoliberalism and other incarnations of capitalist imperialism. Fortunately, well, that bail is clearly completely falling to the wayside, not just what we're seeing happening in Palestine, but what we've been seeing happening all around the world consistently over the last 40 years. Um, they're no longer able to keep this facade that this has anything to do with democracy or social responsibility, and that is still dog-eat-dog -dog capitalist imperialism. Take, um, take whatever you can take, however you can take it. And for me, this is how organized crime feeds into it so effectively. Um, neo, uh, organized crime is to neoliberalism what war was to capitalist imperialism. And that's what we're experiencing in Mexico today. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it. Like it's, yeah, instead of necessarily just like a f like foreign military invasion coming in, it's it can be like state actors or parastate actors, whether they're narco or narco adjacent, going in and displacing a community so that foreign corporations can come in and there's no resistance to them depopulating a forest, for instance, right? Absolutely. That's it in a nutshell. Yeah, that's that's a very it's very well put and throughout the book as well. Well, actually one thing that I didn't ask in here that I think this would be a good place is like for us old heads who were up during the alter globalization period, like the the Bretton Woods organizations are gonna kinda stick in our head as tools for international imposition of neoliberal structures. And I think it's good to name those organizations like the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, which are continuing to like, um, you know, force neoliberal structures into places. The Zapatistas rose up in part in like specifically to the imposition of NAFTA and the changes in the constitutional laws or the ignorant, ignor like ignoring of constitutional laws, protecting communal lands. And I guess in the last couple of years, too, the Mexican legal system has been somewhat shifting internally to model to be like towards a model that is more um, corresponding to the U.S. individual and property focused legal system. I wonder if you could like talk a little bit about not only the military displacement immediately, but also like the legal primitive accumulation that's happening in Mexico. For sure. It's multifaceted, right? It's, it has a lot of different layers. One of the first things that NAFTA did, NAFTA, NAFTA did a lot of different things. We could spend weeks just talking about NAFTA. It's a huge document. It had a huge impact. But there are three things that I feel and that, that I identify in the book that are key. One was that NAFTA forced the revocation of Article 27 of the Mexican Constitution, which which granted Mexico's indigenous people uh, communal property ownership over their collective lands, which made it so that their lands couldn't be sold as individual parcels. NAFTA made it, hey, we should really cut this up into individual parcels. Same thing happened in the 18, I think 1850s, 1890, 1850s, 1890s in the United States with the Dawes Act, right? parceling up native land so that it's a lot harder for native people to stay cohesive and control their territory and be able to resist. Good news is that this has been highly ineffective. 
The bad news is that the response to the, the ineffectiveness of it has been the creation of more paramilitary and narco paramilitary activity. That has been the response. And that's what we're, we're going through now. Um, the Zapatistas are just in the last, I don't know, maybe decade, really starting to confront more narco paramilitarism than any, any other form of state sponsored violence against them. Um, the second thing NAFTA did was allow for the introduction of U.S. agri business corn into the Mexican market, which is an interesting question because, like, you know, Mexicans basically invented corn. Mexican native, Mesoamerican native people basically invented corn. There was no need for U.S. corn. It was a staple crop for subsistence, survival, and organizing in Mexico. So the question is here, how did the U.S. make it for U.S. corn to be even marketable in this environment? Well, the U.S. government subsidized U.S. corn to be sold at a cheaper price to undercut the Mexican campesinos uh, corn. So this was a direct attack to in, in indigenous forms of self-subsistence, right? Um, this is one of the things that the Zapatistas were like, yo, this is a death sentence for us between the privatization of communal lands, the introduction of, of U.S. corn, and now, of course, that has turned into the introduction of several different crops, right, not just corn. The third thing I talk about in terms of NAFTA is this Chapter 11 stipulation, right? Uh, chapter 11 in the document basically says that transnational corporations who invest in, in during NAFTA, at, the, at, at that point, it, it didn't matter if it was Mexico, the United States, or Canada, but a transnational corporation who had an investment for, like, let's say, an extractive activity that could create an environmental uh, situation or a labor situation. If anybody tried to stop that transnational corporation from carrying out their profitable activity, that transnational corporation could sue, including suing federal governments. And who heard these cases was a NAFTA tribunal, right? Uh, oddly enough, it was the Trump administration that was like, wait, 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 wait. We need to opt out of this. And they did. They brought up and they have now this new iteration of the same agreement where Canada has completely opted out of Chapter 11. The United States has opted out of most of what could be damaging upon its territory. But Mexico has been continued to be forced to adhere to Chapter 11. Um, and this is the thing. This is basically a, a contract which subverts national sovereignty. And in doing so, that specifically targets uh, native communities. So today we are now in a situation where we have an industrial corridor being imposed by a supposed leftist Mexican federal government that has for-profit contracts being carried out by the Mexican military to impose this industrial corridor. And this is all legal under that framework, right? So those three things kind of set up a situation where there was no way to confront this other through direct action. Uh, so the Zapatista response and the response of other community-based organizations, organizations that have either chosen to take an armed or an unarmed route, but a more direct action route uh, to this have been the only things that have been affected. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I wonder if you could talk about the some of the through lines that your book broke down um, between like neoliberal policy and its ideological and violent imposition via U.S. arms, military, and enforcement agencies and their proxies in Mexico. Like, can you... Talk a little more about the the CIA DFS connections, or the um, like. How does School of the Americas, uh, currently called WinSec, fit in there? Um, and and the one part like that I'd, I'm really excited to hear about is like where you were talking about during the training, specifically focusing on counterinsurgency and privatization of land. Um, that was like, yeah, for sure. Um... 
there's a lot here, right? I'll, I'll talk about the School of the Americas and then I'll go directly to that from that. Uh, the U.S. Army School of the Americas, for folks that don't know, is like, responsible for atrocities throughout Latin America. Virtually every single dictator, for the exception of Augusto Pinochet in Chile, was trained at the U.S. Army School of the Americas. And his DINA agents were, were known as his Gestapo, were in their in their mostly trained at the U.S. Army School of Americas. In terms of Mexico, we have a list of more than 1,700 Mexican military personnel trained at the U.S. Army School of Americas from 1955 to 2003. The names from 2003 forward have never been released. The last time activists made a major push with U.S. US legislators to try to get those names released, it was actually the Obama administration that suppressed the release of those names. Um, and the thing is, is that as we move forward, we uncover more and more names of Mexican officials trained at the U.S. Army School of the Americas. Specifically with NAFTA, there's a situation that is, I just, I think it's, it's so, it's so clear, right? One year after the Zapatista uprising in 1995, a John Hopkins University expert by the name of Reardon Roet releases this memo to investors from the Chase Manhattan group that had invested in the North American Free Trade Agreement. And he specifically talks about the Zapatistas as a threat. And he says, I well, we don't really think they're a threat, but investors do consider them a threat. And in his memo, he's like, we really think the Mexican federal government should eliminate the Zapatistas. Those are his words. At this time, there was a transition in the Mexican government from President Carlos Salinas de Gortari to Ernesto Cedillo. There was actually an assassination of Mexican presidential candidate in there that we don't need to go into. But Ernesto Cedillo, basically, he sees this memo and he's like, OK, we need, a, we need to do something. So he activates this Mexican general by the name of Jose Ruben Rivas Peña, who is a U.S. Army School of America's graduate. And Jose Ruben Rivas Peña is the creator of most of the paramilitary organizations that were used against the Zapatistas during this time. So the Mexican military off offensive turns into this paramilitary offensive in order to create den deniable atrocities to erode the Zapatista support base. And this is kind of like a point at which we see what we're, we're, we're seeing now is a series of different strategies to carry out deniable atrocities against anything and anybody who's considered a threat to the U.S. neoliberal military political economy in Mexico. Now, we have to understand that, like, farm workers, students, Native people, Central American immigrants, teachers, all these sectors of society are already considered disposable. They're disposable variables in this economic equation. But if any one of these sectors successfully organizes alternatives or challenges to white male Christian neoliberal military political economy, then they're considered a military target. And that's what we're experiencing now is huge swaths of society being considered military targets, okay? That's some pretty heavy to be declaring without some concrete evidence, right? Without like something else to like back it up. Like, I think most of us know, you know, you know that most Mexicans that are involved in anything know this, but that's some pretty heavy to be saying that without something more concrete. Well, <laughs> in 2000, I believe it was the end of 2006, 2007, I went to give a presentation of a documentary film at Kansas University in Lawrence, Kansas. Randomly, a good friend of mine was at grad school there, and she invited me to give this talk. And when I went there, she showed me, hey, look, the local university newspaper is publishing this article that says that our geography department here at Kansas University received a $500,000 grant from the Department of Defense to map communally held indigenous lands in San Luis Potosi in Oaxaca, Mexico. So we were like, this is it. And a whole large group of us dove into that 
and we found out that this project, this military mapping project was called Mexico Indígena was the Mexican incarnation of it in the United States. It was called the Bowman Expeditions. Um, and it was run by the head of the geography department. His name is Jerome Dobson. Now, side note, the anthropology department at Kansas University has Felix Moss. And most people don't know who Felix Moss was, but Felix Moss was kind of the author of the human terrain mapping uh, systems that the U.S. military was engaging in during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So they already had this precedent. Well, Jerome Dobson basically decided he wanted to do this for geography. And the idea was that they were going to work with the U.S. military to begin mapping these lands in collaboration with the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense official involved in this is a lieutenant colonel by the name of Jeffrey Demarest. And Jeffrey Demarest uh, was at the time was working at Fort Leavenworth there in Kansas. And he was a senior analyst with the Foreign Military Studies Office. At the time, they changed kind of their mission statement because back then we published it. At the time, the Foreign Military Studies Office's main mission statement was that they focused on asymmetric and emerging threats to U.S. political and economic interests. Asymmetric were clearly armed crimin or criminal organizations, guerrilla movements, but emerging threats were very clearly social movements, right? So this guy, Jeffrey Demarest, he's also a U.S. Army School of America's graduate. He's one of the authors of Plan Colombia and Colombia. He worked with this professor, Jerome Dobson, and another underling by the name of Peter Herlihy to gather a group of graduate students from Kansas University. And they went to San Luis Potosí in Oaxaca and went into Native communities and lied to them and said that they wanted to do a participatory mapping project with them to help them defend their communities against neoliberalism all the time with this DOD funding. Well, we put two and two together and were able to very, we were scared man, when this was going on because it was hard to like figure out where it was going on and how. And I mean, oddly enough, it was going on with like people that we knew that had no idea what was going on. Some people at one point saw a foreign military studies office logo on one of the maps that were originally presented and then they, they removed that. So other people never saw that again. And it was a question that came up, but people didn't follow up on it. Um, eventually, we were able to track where this was going, where the mapping was going on. And the mapping was going on in communities that were unarmed, not engaging in any sort of guerrilla activity or anything like that, but communities that were practicing traditional forms of collective or communal land tenure and traditional forms of self-governance. And they were being targeted. Well, Jeffrey Demarest published a series of articles and books publicly about his thoughts on this. And basically what Jeffrey Demarest says is that communal property ownership leads to insurgency and criminality and only solution is privatization. So we proved irrefutably that there was a U.S. military counterinsurgency strategy being carried out in Oaxaca targeting com Native communities who practice traditional forms of land tenure and self-governance, which is at the core of Native survival. So this was a strategy of genocide that was exposed, and we got them kicked out. <laughs> communities came together they found out boom we organized we shut that down they got kicked out i spent the following four years hunting down the grad students who participated unwittingly and finding each and every single one and making them cry in public presentations that i did at kansas university showing them what had happened uh, like I said, this had already happened in anthropology and the American Association of Anthropologists did at one point make a public ban on this type of activity and called it uh, an ethics violation. And we're like, we, we, we can't support this. Jerome Dobson from 
from Kansas University was about to become the president of the American Association of Geographers. He was already the president of the American Geographical Society, which was already kind of an elitist organization, but the American Association of Geographers, that's like an academic, more popular thing. He was about to become the president. He was a shoe in for his work and we were able to shut him down. Just killed it for him. Um, he got called in by his internal review board. He said he was going on sabbatical and then he wanted to go work directly with the State Department. He was like, okay, my academic career is over. Um, that all kind of happened quietly. They're out there still doing this work. The American Association of Geographers has still to this day yet to yet say anything. Um, because geographers are like, well, where are we going to find work? Work is is with the military at this point. Um, and it's been a, a, an issue. There are plenty of badass, radical geographers that were on board, have been on board, continue to support my work, continue to confront this issue. And I still, to this day, get emails from geographers who are like, hey, I got offered this job. And I started to ask questions and it was another military mapping job. And thanks for your work, I didn't take it. I didn't get duped. Um, so this was like the, the smoking gun. You know, at the end of all this, talk, all this, what you could say, you know, a lot of people were like, this is conspiratorial. Well, no, there, this, this was a fact. This was happening. This was intentional. And this was what their philosophy was, you know? Um, and that was, that was fully exposed. It's important to say that this all was detonated at the same time as the 2006 Oaxaca uprising. So the, the importance of traditional forms of self-governance and land tenure in being viable methods of confronting the, the neoliberal military political economy were considered so viable that the US military was involved, right? At one point I shared this with uh, guerrilleros from the community uprising against narco governance in Chiran, Michoacan. And some of the some of the guardabosques started to cry because they're like, man, we're being targeted by the US military apparatus. And at the time their commanding officer was like, hey man, I don't know why y'all are crying. If we're being targeted by them, it's because we're badass. And that is what you need to take away from this. And that's true. At the end of the day, it was all very true. What people are doing was and is and continues to be the most effective uh, way to confront these uh, strategies of the neoliberal military political economy in Mexico. Does that answer? I think that's kind of where yeah. you wanted me to go. That was where I wanted you to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that to me, that that's probably one of the most important things that I ever did, and also. One of, you know, got me the most political blowback and threats and harassment from both the U.S. government and the Mexican government in all of this work. Um, my family was threatened. I was followed. People's cars got ransacked in houses that I stayed at in Lawrence, Kansas, while confronting the graduate students. Like things like over the top things happened during that time. I had had issues like that since but at that time that was kind of like the peak of of like the type of harassment that I ever received for the work that I did. Yeah, I mean that's that's super scary especially because you were like you're li literally uncovering this like genocidal pattern of ongoing settler colonialism or just colonialism like tip of the spear like pointing that out, that's definitely going to put a spotlight on you. That yeah, that's it sure it sure did. Yeah, JTTF went and threatened my parents. <laughs> it was it was rough. It was rough. Don't mess with academics. I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> If you want to support The Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and the zines that we produce, 
from each interview. Consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibrePay. Or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf slash support. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Hello, and welcome to We Will Remember Freedom, a monthly podcast of anarchist fiction. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. Hello, and welcome to Live Like the World is Dying, your podcast for what feels like the end times. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. Hello, and welcome to The Jingle for both of my podcasts. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. You can find my podcasts wherever you get your podcasts or get them from the Channel Zero Network. There's a lot of inspiring stories that you share of indigenous-led liberation movements, past and ongoing in Mexico, in the book. Uh, many listeners obviously will have heard about the Zapatistas, we've been referring to a few times. But I wonder if you could speak a bit about some of the other examples that you bring up and some of the wisdom that could be gleaned for land defense and community liberation struggles elsewhere, particularly for uh, racialized and marginalized and indigenous communities. For sure. Um, there's... Four, like, kind of situations that I look at, obviously, the Zapatista National Liberation, the Oaxacan People's Popular Assembly during the Oaxaca uprising in Oaxaca City in 2006. There is the, uh, oh, before that, the National Autonomous University student strikes in 1999, which was instrumental to all of my political education because I just, I went there as that was happening, and they're the ones that took me and kind of showed me everything that I learned to get to do the things that I'm doing to this day. And then the last one is the Purepecha municipality of Chelan, Michoacan, who rose up against narco governments effectively in 2011 and has been uh, as an ongoing communal self-governing project that is super effective and has been has been doing very well. So really out of those, the native ones are Cheran and Oaxaca. Oaxaca is a city, but is a very native city, right? A lot of natives in Oaxaca would not consider themselves native because they live in a state where like you go up in the mountains and people are, you know, native, right? But the reality is, is that they're more and more native than most places. Oaxaca city is probably one of the most native cities in the hemisphere and their the influence of traditional forms of self-governance influenced that uprising in a way that was super powerful. Um, and I think that's it's super important to point out. What I focused on in the book more than anything was all the layers of repression that the state government had to do to confront that. Like there were so many layers of not just like urban youth paramilitaries, paramilitary death squads, military. Uh, uh, Federal police. Um, yeah, police doing illegal drive-bys, like every possible tool of repression that is available to the state was used. And that's what had to happen, right? And what I gleaned from, all, what, I, what I learned from this even before seeing what we saw in Chiran, which it just kind of reinforces the idea, is that the greatest form of political power is not any sort of political power, any, any sort of political party or any sort of politician or any sort of platform or reform. It is thousands of people willing to risk everything to affect change. You have thousands of people that are willing to die. That makes radical change. That's what the Zapatistas did. That's the, what the Waka and People's Popular Assembly did. Though it wasn't completely effective in kicking out the governor or making any sort of long-term radical change, what they were able to do, taking over an 800,000-person city for six months and holding it for six months and then forcing this level of 
multi-layered repression to be used in order to shut it down over the course of six months. And then finally, a federal military police force being brought in and t- it taking that them two months to shut that down. That level of resistance is incredible. It's historic. And then in Chiran, you know, as a 25,000, Chiran Michoacan, the Purepecha community that rose up against the narco government, we're talking about a 25,000 person community that has now prohibited electoral politics in their community, has banned institutional forms of governance, has done their best to return to traditional forms of self-governance, took away the cops' weapons, still hold those weapons, still have their own community-based policing and forest patrol. Thousands of people putting their life on the line gets the goods. And that's what it is. I mean, now, obviously, we're in a situation where today with Palestine, where we do have thousands of people that are willing to die and they're, they're being killed. And, and there's n- nothing is happening to end that. We're all being we're all being exposed as in sham. We're all being exposed. Our humanity is being exposed as a farce. None of us is radical enough or powerful enough to do anything in this situation. And I don't have an answer for that. But the examples that I give in Mexico were able to effectively put their lives on the line and effect radical change. But I want to, I want to be honest and be like, you know, I'm, I'm in tears. I'm. I have to bow my head. I have to bow my my head in shame, because I don't know what I could do to contribute to Palestinian liberation in the face of the genocide that we're seeing uh, right now. Now I haven't really had a platform to talk about that in any way. I haven't really had the space. I don't even really consider myself knowledgeable enough, or 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 I don't know, valid enough. I don't know. I feel like, I feel like, I feel like scum over that, you know? And I don't know, I don't know what to do, but I think it's important to point out that what I'm saying is, is definitely contradicted by that, by that situation. And that we, we need to really evaluate, reevaluate absolutely everything that we are doing as organizers, as resistors as radicals as academics as activists as community as humans in the face of what we're seeing happen happen there but i do think that we can draw from from these experiences and think about what possibilities can look like and when it comes to liberation in like an urban setting in the united states or in other places in the world i think that we can think about I always talk to my students in the United States and I say, you know, you all live in a prison of your own comfort. You know, one of the main ways that we're controlled is through comfort. You know, nobody's really, I mean, we're talking about people willing to risk their lives in the global North. People aren't really willing to risk the hot water or their AC or their jobs or their cars or their flat screens or their bongs or their kicks or all these different things that make life so comfortable. And we're kind of being held in the prison of that comfort. And I think now is a super critical moment in the face of what we're seeing to begin to talk about how are we going to get more uncomfortable? We have to really start to ask ourselves, what are we willing to risk and sacrifice in order to contribute to global liberation, right? And that includes Palestinian liberation. That includes uh, liberation for all the people that are confronting uh, the global military industrial complex, the, the U.S. monetary hegemony, um, all the, all these powerful things that that are clearly willing to annihilate us for their for their political, economic, and military agenda. Hope I didn't veer too much there. 
No, that's like, I think it's important. I think it's important to put that in there one way or another. I haven't, I haven't had a platform where I felt like, you know, I, yeah, I could put that in there, but it's important. Yeah. And even not, even not having an answer, like, I think the asking of the question is, is good. Like it's not going to get answered if people aren't asking it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess, do you want me to continue with the questions or do you want to like try to veer off in that direction a little more? I don't, whatever you'd like. I mean, I think I'm, I'm, we can go, go on with the, with the questions. Well, I guess like tying into that, I was like one question that I did have that sort of ties into that is like Mexico is likely surpassed only by Palestine and how dangerous, dangerous it is for journalists and like journalism, like we have to admit, like, if you have the idea of a population knowing what's going on, you have to have like concerted efforts to find out, to get that information out. And it's like, it's a core to being able to popularly organize. I don't know if you'd like to speak a bit about the importance of independent journalism in Mexico and the danger that it, it, it poses to the impunity of the state and capital there. And also maybe if there are any other projects besides Avispa that you want to shout out that are doing a good job that people should pay attention to. Right now it's all Avispa. I would point at them more than anybody else. I love I love their work. I have a personal relationship with them. My and right now is a particularly complicated moment because we have this supposed leftist president who turns out is an evangelical Christian that is far more, far more neoliberal and has effectively militarized the Mexican state much better than the National Action Party or the Institutional Revolutionary Party were ever able to do under the guise of this like supposed leftist agenda. And it's absolutely frightening. There are soldiers, the, the, the new military police known as the Guardia Nacional or the National Guard is everywhere and under this leftist president the general in charge of the Guardia Nacional General Bucio is a graduate of the U.S. Army School of the Americas too and that's where we're at you know we're at this situation where uh, I do fear I fear for for independent journalists I, I fear for journalists in general um fortunately you know the homies are good they know how to move you know they ain't got kids <laughs> not having kids is kind of key you know there uh, things change when you have kids you know um they know how to you know and they see you know they know when it's time to bust a move when it's time to go under when it's time to pop up how to hide their identities and things like that and they they do their work good but i'm always going to be concern for their safety and their well-being under these conditions. Um, that said, the work that they're doing is super powerful and super important and needs to be shouted out. And if you see a donate button on their website, if you see any way to support them, I don't know if they've gotten anything up there for that, please, please support Avispa Media. I would support them above anybody else right now. Do you have time for a couple more questions? Sure do. Okay. So one of the this is kind of like jumping the border again, but one of the riveting, well, not exactly. One of the really riveting parts for me were the chapters laying out the origins and implications of what you term the farm mafia and the banksters um, and their lack of oversight by the lawyers and politicians filling the government seats in Mexico, the U S and elsewhere. And so, and in particular, like it wasn't mentioned in there, but some of the corruption scandals around HSBC um, like really, really came about at the same time as the housing crisis was hitting a lot of North America too, um, due to the banks over leveraging, like, I don't even understand the math of it, but, um, financializing the housing markets and specifically like throwing borrowers of color, um, under the, you know, under the bus and then getting written off by the government. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, about that sort of like, corruption in the industries and the impunity when it comes to government with that for sure uh, let me start with what you you mentioned about the housing i actually had a chapter that was going to go into that and i just didn't feel it was like complete enough you know 
um, and kind of veered a little bit. But one of the things that is super important to note is that there was a Justice Department official at some point that I don't think I don't even think I was even able to find the quote again. But at one point there was a Justice Department official. I, I believe it might have even been Lenny Brewer, the dude that, that talked on the HSBC case. He was prosecuting the HSBC case that said that the 2008 financial crisis was cushioned by a lot of this cartel money in the banking industry, right? What is super important for people to understand is that cartel money, and this is also from the Justice Department, three quarters of cartel money ends up in banks, in major international banks, US banks. Um, and many of these banks have been busted for just kind of allowing this to happen. And they receive what are known as deferred prosecution agreements where nobody gets busted. They pay a fine and this all gets swept under the carpet and continues to function exactly the way it has always functioned. Um, the HSBC case is super important. I put in the entire <laughs> the first prosecution agreement and they're kind of reorganized because I think it's so important for people to see how profound and clear the complicity of bank executives was in this case, you know? Um, and I, I, I threw in there, you know, there's like money, all, all sorts of money laundering organizations and the government is always talking about how we're busting these money laundering organizations, right? You're talking about like $2 million, $3 million from some group of cholos or Chinese restaurant owners that did some sort of money laundering, maybe even under duress, right? But we're talking about hundreds of millions, and in some cases, a couple of trillion dollars of laundered money in these financial institutions and nobody got locked up. HSBC cases is, is, I mean, the the case and what happened in 2012 was the Justice Department was able to prove that HSBC executives, both at the international and the US offices were aware of what was going on. This was published in the New York Times and Salon Magazine and at one point, I think the New York Times was the one that asked Lenny Brewer, hey, so why didn't you bust the bankers? Like somebody got to get locked up. And Lenny Brewer was straight up. He's like, they're too powerful to lock up. Lenny Brewer, and at the time, the attorney general was Eric Holder. This is all under the Obama administration, which is like always interesting to point out because people are like, oh, Obama, Obama was great. Trump is, Obama was whack. And his attorney general was whack. Both Eric Holder and Lenny Brewer used to work for, I think it's, it's Covington, I don't know, it's Covington, I can't remember the second name, Berlin, but this is like law firm that specifically defends banks for like money laundering cases. And then they started to work for the Justice Department and then they both went back to work for the law firm before the deferred prosecution agreement was done with HSBC. Anyway, that's that to me, the revolving door on that is incredible and is super important to wear out. HSBC received a $1.9 billion fine, five and a half years or five years of independent monitoring. The independent monitor released, a, or somehow we were able to get a little bit of the report on the fourth year and he was like, yo, nothing's changed. On the fifth year when the report was supposed to be made public, the Obama administration suppressed the release of the report citing that it would expose vulnerabilities and bang it would expose a whole system of corruption is what it would expose. So it wasn't released, never, it's never been released. Who was it? I can't remember the, the journalist from Buzzfeed that did the last FOIA request for it was denied. That's never going to be released. The, the number, there's like 17 banks that have multiple different prosecution agreements for continuing to launder cartel money. And to me, this is like exposes just a huge hole in this entire system, right? To me, this is like one of the things that 
makes nation states Ill illegitimate in and of themselves. And that's kind of like the, what I've been touring, this last tour that I did right now in, uh, in February was like, the nation state is illegitimate. We need to stop even considering nation states legitimate at all. There are maybe, around, I don't know, 250, 200 and, some, 200 and some plus nation states in the world. There are over 5,000 stateless nations in the world like Palestine that are being targeted and slowly annihilated by these 250 criminal nation states around the world. And this type of activity is to me what most exposes the criminality and illegitimacy. When it comes to the pharmaceutical industry, just to kind of get to the other part of your question, you know, I, I didn't know that the pharmaceutical industry was the largest lobby out of all industries. You know, I would have uh, gone for weapons or oil. Pharmaceutical industry is four times as big in, on lobbying than the weapons industry and two times bigger than the oil industry. And man, these guys, you know, at the time that I wrote the book, I was like, why don't we have a Netflix, Netflix show on it? And finally Netflix did do some shows, but of course the Netflix like mini series and movies that have come out about pharmaceutical, like they did one on the Sackler family, Purdue Pharma, and they did one on Insys, what's his name? He's like, he was like the only pharmaceutical CEO of color. Of course he did time, right? Uh, I can't remember his name, um, but they did their shows, but they kind of like make it like these isolated, try to make it out like these isolated. The bad apples. Yeah, you know, but at the end of the day, it's the whole system. The amount of legislators that have allowed the banking industry and the pharmaceutical industry to get away with the type of criminal, on the, in the case of the banking industry, the laundering activity, in the case of the pharmaceutical industry, the, the influx of addictive substances into the human into the United States population. You know, you know that Mexican cart I, I talk about this in the book, Mexican cartels are now producing pill form opioids to compete against the pharmaceutical industry. That's what that's the point we're at now. The pharmaceutical industry straight up stole DEA officials who were who were in charge of investigating the pharmaceutical industry and hired them to work for them. If we're going to talk about narco governance, like yeah, we can talk about narco governance in Mexico and talk about oh, the corruption and and I can I we can tell you you know we we're at the point where you don't know if political power, business elite power or narco power is more powerful than the other. My conclusion is that it's about the same because it varies from place to place, but they have about the same amount of power across the board in Mexico. And it's over yeah. too. Uh, and it overlaps and that's clear. And like, if you want to know, and also I don't write about that because all you got to do is Google stuff and watch a Netflix series. And most of it is, is legit. That's how it is, you know, but that's not really the, the bigger deal. The bigger deal is the narco governance within this supposed empire, the supposed or the supposed official, I, I, I don't mean empire, it is official US government apparatus, right? Um, the corruption between the pharmaceutical industry, the banking industry, and U US legislative bodies is so overwhelming and so responsible for the opioid epidemic, so responsible for allowing narco activity to continue to go on in Mexico, so responsible for the for-profit weapons industry, the prison industrial complex, all these different things that are just criminal at their core that I don't really think anything else is so important to talk about anymore, right? Yeah. Cartels are horrible. Yeah, they they do horrible things. But at the end of the day, when you have this so-called legitimate system that facilitates and profits and regenerates all that violence, 
I think that that's where our focus should be on. And I think that that's where we need to start turning our heads in talking about delegitimizing the nation state in and of itself, their financial institutions, their transnational corporations, right? And and from there, we, we may get somewhere where we can break this down enough to where we can hope to generate some real global liberation that includes Palestinian liberation. That's my hope. Do you have sort of jumping forward? Cause there's a, there's a lot there, but, but kind of on like where, what we can do and, and how most of the listening audiences is, is in the U S um, most of the, like the radio stations that it plays on are all in the U S. So I wonder if you have any suggestions of practices and actions of solidarity concerning the impacts of the U S border arming and training of paramilitaries or official forces and U S economic policy towards the impact that, that impact people South of the Rio Grande, Rio Grande, that you'd suggest listeners consider engaging in or learning more about? I fear for y'all. And I, and I hate to do that. I hate to like put that out there. It's not that easy. I fear I, like when I go to the States, it's like, I'm, it's so scary. It's, we did this, like we did this, this ad hoc, probably not very scientific analysis about like how many far right wing how effective has the far right been at constructing grassroots, community-based self-determination, self-defense and autonomy in comparison to the left in the United States? And the, num the number disparity is, is absolutely astonishing. Right? We kind of figure there's probably a good 10 million white supremacists that are stockpiling food and weapons and have safe houses and are preparing for a situation that is super frightening. And when you look at us, the numbers are pretty low. Only thing I can say that positive, positive, that's positive there is that though they do seem like to have some sort of unity on certain points, at the end of the day, they end up eating each other alive. And there's all this like, you know, over the time we've seen like the like the different immigrant hunting organizations, you know, they have, have had all this pedophilia exposed and some of their kids, like some kids shot their dad. <laughs> and, and they have all this stuff that at the end of the day, they're not really as like united as, as you, but still 10 million is a lot of people. And I don't feel that people are taking that serious enough. I don't feel like people are considering what we're confronting. We're confronting a global movement towards far right wing fascism, right? The way things are going is that the for profit industries and the nation states that we are talking about as criminal are every day becoming less interested in continuing the theater of false democracy and social responsibility, and very much so willing to enter into political, economic, and military fascism to obtain their, their goals. The day that Trump won the election, I uh, took screenshots of, there's an article on it in Amigo Comun, right? I think it's called The Face, Trump, The Face of Neoliberal Fascism. That's the name of the article. I took screenshots of the U.S. stock market and looked at like weapons industry, pharmaceuticals, real estate, banking, you know, just the, the, the cream of the crop. And everything skyrocketed that day. The entire economic apparatus was like, yes, this is what we need. We need to have free reign to do whatever that we want. And this can give it to us. Clearly, as things progress, people are like, wait, 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 this guy's kind of <laughs> kind of over the top and not everybody, you know. But the attitude behind it is, is, is that. One, two, people need to stop having this idea that the far right is like some hillbilly in Alabama. You know, we learned in 2016 that it's like tech bros, that it's like gamers, that it's 
dudes with a hundred and two hundred thousand dollar a year salaries and good jobs and college educations and and they're being like hey i am interested in my self-preservation i am interested in my self-determination my community's autonomy all the while having these like anti-capitalist anti-imperialist kind of undertones to their argumentation that is legitimized when they look at things like the democratic party or or anything that is is quote unquote liberal in the united states none of that stuff is is confronting the nation state or transnational corporations or the U.S. political economy in any real effective way. It's further legitimizing the U.S. military political economy by participating in it. But, but you know, I feel like, like the, it's really easy. I feel like it's really easy for the far right to point at liberals and the left as a legitimizing force of wealth and power inside of the U.S. military political economy, as opposed to any, anything that is confronting the true corrupt nature of our government. One, two, this young woman, I, a friend of mine's daughter the other day was like, you know, one of the things is, is that y'all on the left are super inaccessible and super closed off and super critical of everybody. But those guys on the right, they'll anybody and anybody that has like any whack-ass ideas they're all like yeah come come hang out and they're growing in this way that we are not and we really need to think about what are we doing to grow as a movement to really challenge the far right i don't have any answers there at this point my faith is in the youth my book is kind of uh, like my, my report, like this is what we saw, this is what's going on here. Please take this and run with it and, and figure out what we gotta do, right? We are failing. My generation, we have failed to, to provide a truly effective confrontation to this situation within the United States. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I implore older people, if you're older than 30 and you don't have mentors younger than 30, you're probably full. And that's where I think this is going to go. We need to start listening to what young people are thinking, what they're going to start proposing, what they're going to look at, how they're processing information and what type of proposals they're going to have. And we need to provide them with the tools of our, what we've been able to see so they can effectively challenge this. Well, thank you so much, Simone, for having this conversation. I'll put in the show notes where folks can get the book. Um, are there any places you're blogging right now? Or are you working on like other projects or ways that they can, I guess you've got a website if you want to name that. Yeah, the weaponsdrugsmoney.org is where you can get the book. We're going to be, like I said, publishing chapter by chapter, like once a month on El Enemigo Común. Um, the book is being translated. It's been translated to Italian, Spanish. We're about to get French going. So it's going to start moving all over the place in the United States. Uh, Spanish and English is available on the website, institutional copies for academic institutions, for higher learning institutions go along with the PDF so that students can get the PDF for free. I don't want students having to pay for the book, but I do want academic institutions to pay an extra fee for it. So we're trying to get those out there. They're starting to move little by little. Um, and yeah, uh, you can find uh, Weapons, Drugs, and Money on Facebook, Instagram, and communicate with me through there. Awesome. Thanks a lot for having the chat. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your work. I really appreciate the platform. It's my pleasure. Yeah, thanks. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. Let's talk about conspiracy theories and manifestos. A couple of events happened this past week that got mainstream media attention. And when I watched the news, brought to me by Walt Disney, I was left a bit confused. 
It felt like the information that I was provided wasn't the information I needed to know, and it felt like the information I needed, the information you would normally expect, was omitted. First, the guy who lit himself on fire outside of the Trump trial. The mainstream media gave me two pieces of information. One, he poured gasoline on his head, lit a match, and immolated himself. Two, he was a conspiracy theorist, according to what journalists could see on his social media. The second case, an Asian kid who might be trans was stopped before committing a mass shooting at his school. In this case, again, mainstream media gave me two pieces of information. One, the mass shooting didn't happen. Two, the kid wrote a manifesto. So, conspiracy theories and manifestos. I don't know. The words jumped out at me. It feels like those are really loaded words. And it feels like those words are used by media when the goal is to make us feel less empathy with the subject of the story. In the case of the conspiracy theorist who immolated himself, all we know is that he lit himself on fire. But we can just stick that in a box, so to speak, the conspiracy theorist box. You know how those conspiracy theorists are. But what does that really mean? Was this guy a QAnon wingnut who thought Hillary Clinton led a cabal of Satan worshippers to molest kids in a New York City pizzeria? Tinfoil hats and motherships? Or something else? Perhaps he thought someone was out to get him. Does that make him a conspiracy theorist? Because I'll tell you right now, I've got lots of fart goblins out to get me. And I know, because they repeatedly got me. I'm reminded Henry Kissinger once said of Richard Nixon, Paranoids have enemies too. The implication, of course, is that just because someone's burrito isn't tight, too tightly wrapped, that doesn't mean his enemies are imaginary. And speaking of Nixon, weren't Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein conspiracy theorists right up until the Watergate story broke wide open? All good reporters are conspiracy theorists. So it seems hypocritical when my news puts that label on people. All of us have enemies or exploiters or oppressors, and we all have theories as to how those people are operating. Some of us are right. The second story about the mass shooting that was prevented attributed a manifesto to the would-be shooter. That's a hot-button word, manifesto. It seems these days that manifestos are always the work of crackpots and wackadoodles. And if the writers are not crackpots and wackadoodles, they fall in the crackpot and wackadoodle category by virtue of writing a manifesto. But how many manifestos are manifestos? The Communist Manifesto was a manifesto. It was right there in the name. But what about the Unabomber Manifesto? Ted Kaczynski didn't call it that. He called it industrial society and its future. Media called it the Unabomber Manifesto. I imagine if it were called industrial society and its future, more people might be inclined to read it. What does manifesto even mean? Couldn't anything be a manifesto? Couldn't any memoir be a manifesto? I wrote Ohio and Opposing Torture, available from LBC Books and wherever good books are stolen. Are those manifestos? Couldn't any cookbook be considered a food manifesto? But back to the mass shooting that didn't happen. It appears we have a teenager writing stuff, maybe fantasizing about violence, maybe sharing those fantasies with other kids, seeking validation and approval. And so the shooting that didn't happen becomes a criminal conspiracy. Doesn't that make the investigators conspiracy theorists? In fact, aren't all investigators at all times conspiracy theorists? At any rate, I think I'd rather have a troubled team blowing off steam by writing about violence rather than carrying it out. That's just me. And since the shooting didn't happen, I have to wonder how we conclude it would have happened if the law enforcement conspiracy theorists hadn't stopped, stepped in to save the day. 
Maybe it would have. Maybe the kid never intended to do it anyway. But what I find is, once the kid is a manifesto writer, I'm supposed to think it's more likely that the kid intended to kill people. I mean, we know how those manifesto writers are. Big picture here, we live in a world where information is weaponized, where alternative facts bombard us on a constant basis, where truth becomes relative. It doesn't much help matters when mainstream media engages in pretty obvious manipulations, spoon-feeding us conclusions and loaded words designed to get us to think a certain way, or more accurately, to not think. But we have to unpack hot-button words and question the motives of mainstream journalists. This feeds into the narratives of the Donald Trumps and Rudy Giuliani's, lends credence to the yahoos who say that kids at Sandy Hook never existed, makes QAnon posts more clickable. Mainstream media is a disempowering accomplice to the very corrosive forces it rolls its eyes at. We live in a world full of conspiracy theorists and manifestos. When we don't know what these words necessarily mean, they don't mean anything. And then neither does anything else. Everything means anything, and everything means nothing. This is manifesto writing and conspiracy theorizing Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're conspiracy theorizing or writing a manifesto, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A two four. Three two zero five, OSP Youngstown, eight seven eight Coitsville Hubbard Road, Youngstown Ohio four four five zero five. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. This is the Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. Programming support is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm is a bookstore and social movement space owned by its workers in operation since 2008. Their event calendar and complete catalog of books can be found online at firestorm.coop.